Judy Ferrara is a writer and visual artist who lives in Worcester. She has worked as a teacher, a college professor. Uh, she majored in education, but noted that her heart went to art uh, in wanting to major, but she was discouraged and told that uh, the art teachers were the first ones to be laid off. But her heart has always been with art, as, has, as it has been with poetry in her life. Uh, she'll be sharing her art with you today, and in her bio uh, there is mention that she returned to visual art after a 40-year hiatus. And uh, she has been going strong, and her art has been exhibited in uh, a number of prominent and prestigious places in Massachusetts and, and perhaps beyond. Uh, you can keep up with Judy in her visual art world on her blog palette and pen and know where she'll be bringing and exhibiting it next. And Judy also has two collections of her poetry, and she notes that the process of painting is similar to her in some ways, as is writing poetry, and there is a bit of a mystery to what evolves in the creation of it. And for Judy, she has created in this poetry over time two collections uh, of poetry, um, including gestures of trees and a brush with words, she has been published in a number of poetry journals, and she has also been busy in the world of poetry since 2009, uh, helping to create a house tour for the uh, world-renowned poet Stanley Kunitz in Worcester, and uh, she has been busy working, transcribing, and editing a memoir of his mother's uh, based on her diary, um, and so that's something to stay tuned to. Um, and and she most recently, uh, she uh, has uh, brought to the world uh, the book, The Little O, The Earth, Travel Journals, Art, and Poems, as her most recent work. And perhaps we might be hearing a bit of that today as Judy comes to share her poetry and her thoughts with us. So please give a warm morning welcome to Judy Ferrara. Thank you, uh, Cheryl, um, and my, my deepest, sincerest thanks to the HCAM crew and to the extraordinary, as you all know, Cheryl Perot. Today, uh, it will be traveling for all of us. That's what we're going to be thinking about, but with a strong art backbone. Today, we're going to stop at Buffalo. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> Chicago, I've heard that all my life about Buffalo. Chicago, Manhattan, Italy, France, England. So I'll be reading about 10 minutes from the book, uh, journals and poems, two journals and two poems, so it's going to be a balance. And then I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the making of the artwork. I'd like to just start with having us all think about travel. And I kind of thought, how, how can you just uh, uh, get everyone on the same page, literally? And so these are some thoughts. Travel provides inspiration for everyone, especially artists and writers. Travel enhances your powers of observation, makes you alert. Henri Matisse said, travel is a means of cleansing the eye, a fresh way of seeing. And I think we all know that travel requires a combination of privilege, curiosity, good luck, adequately good health, patience, and a passion to do it. So I'd like to start with one of the journal entries. And it's the tribute to the Albright Knox Art Gallery. 
How does one fall in love with the arts? Be lucky enough to grow up in Buffalo, New York from the 40s through the mid 60s. The arts mattered to schools. Students were transported by busloads to listen to the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra, to gawk at the treasures in the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, and to experience the astounding collection of 19th and 20th century art at the Albright Art Gallery. I graduated from Buffalo State College directly across the street from the Albright, renamed the Albright Knox when I was a sophomore. I felt as if I belonged in that museum when I dropped in between classes because I had been brought there as a younger student. I knew and I didn't know what was waiting for me inside. Some days I barely had bus fare to get to class, but I could still stop at the Albright Knox because it was free. Free admission meant that I could gobble up Matisse's La Musique or be held spellbound by Gauguin's The Yellow Christ. My early fascination with Marc Chagall began with extended examinations of peasant life. Mark Rothko's Orange and Yellow, 1956 and Franz Klein's New York, New York, 1953. They excited a hunger in me that would last a lifetime. Did I understand or like everything I heard or saw? Of course not. Mixed feelings of awe or joy mixed with those feelings were moments of boredom and discomfort. Now I know that these were the developing seeds of my own taste in the arts. The more I tasted, the more it changed and expanded. I was enrolling in a lifelong course called Connoisseurship 101, a continuous stream of learning about the arts. My quest has taken me from the Albright Knox to museums across the United States and Europe, as well as Scandinavia, Russia, and Turkey. I remember the thrill of recognizing and not having a little, not a little pride, reading an exhibi exhibition label at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. The lending museum was the Albright Knox Art Gallery. It was not the only time I would silently salute this fine museum. Some things do not change for the better. The paints in Georges Rouault's clown portrait sank so much that I could barely make out its rich colors and shapes. Last time I visited, it wasn't even on display. And after a long record of free admission, the museum began charging in 1992. And as, as an art lover, lover and artist, museums are part of my continuing education, so I gladly pay the price. People travel to see landscapes, meet others, absorb history and music, experience the cuisine, and marvel at the architecture. I do that too, but my primary purpose is to visit art museums. Michael Kimmelman expressed it best. People go to museums to, in the end, to have an experience unlike what they can get elsewhere because works of art are not like everything else in life. And now, from Buffalo, New York, let's go to Rome. It's probably warmer there. <laughs> Hotel Tapestry, and this is a prose poem, so it's written in paragraphs, but it's poetry. Hotel Tapestry. Goose tucked under her arm a sturdy peasant strides toward the village. The folds of her skirt swing in silent rhythm, a dagger peeking from under her apron. Dust on her cherry cheeks. On the horizon, the Colosseum sits in dumb grandeur. Guard at the elevator with his helmet and sword chased with fake gold, bruised chin smile with a front tooth missing, comes an offer to pose with him, battle-worn special effects, 
two euros and not a cloud in the lobby. Walk outside. The streets teem with torches and pickpockets. A gypsy holds her apron taut. A few coins jump, catch your eye. Scab on her hand. On the ground, a rotten apple pulls you into its stink. Your eyes, radiant with alabaster and rain. Your suitcase filled with clean clothes. Rome, a pyramid of limes next to a bin of red grapes. A jet approaches Leonardo da Vinci. Birds scream in the trees. And now my other journal that I'm going to share today. It's called Museum Shoes. And these are my museum shoes. If you could only be where they've been. <sighs> To all the musicians in the room, and I know there are many, uh, Cole Porter wrote a wonderful song called You're the Top and provided uh, the inspiration for this journal. As I listened to Ella Fitzgerald sing the introduction to You're the Top, two things made me chuckle. Cole Porter's feigned modesty at words poetic, I'm so pathetic, and his last of the best and most famous in the world. The familiar lyrics struck me in an unfamiliar way, so I sat down in my studio and listened to the song again. The Colosseum, the Louvre Museum, the Tower of Pisa, the Mona Lisa, Whistler's Mama, and London's National Gallery glided by, making me realize that travel to these icons of art and architecture was not even an option for me much of my life. By dint of hard work, intense desire, meager savings, and special deals, my husband John Gaumond and I managed to go to each place and become as besotted as Cole Porter. Wearing my clunky, old, beyond comfortable black leather museum shoes, I never could have predicted how much this pair of plain ankle-high boots would justify their price during visits to New York, Hartford, Chicago, Cambridge, Massachusetts and England, Boston, Rome, Paris, Florence, St. Petersburg, or London. If my shoes could talk, they would describe times that I seem to levitate. I will limit myself to 10 top places. Hats off to Cole Porter. Number one the Art Institute of Chicago. I rounded a corner and walked into a gallery only to see Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, 1942, with its quartet of figures in a diner wedged in yellow light. It was a surprise to suddenly encounter this icon of American art, like bumping into someone famous in an elevator. Two, the Hermitage, St. Petersburg, Russia. It was a warm August day and the palace windows had been opened. Screens and air conditioning were not part of the museum's standard operating equipment. <laughs> While I studied Goya's port portrait of the actress Antonia Zarate, a fly landed on it. My impulse to shoo it away from its resting spot was difficult to overcome, but I controlled myself, imagining how guards might interpret my movement. <clears throat> Three, Saint Chapelle, Paris. Climbing the narrow corkscrew staircase from the lower chapel, I was unprepared for the soaring space with its seemingly unbroken expanses of stained glass. It took my breath away. Four, the Louvre, Paris. When I saw artists at their easels in the galleries, I was witnessing the tradition of copying the masters. I paused to think about others who had set up their easels in earlier times. 
five. The Albright Knox Art Gallery Buffalo. Standing in front of Matisse's La Musique, I remember I, how I had been entranced with this painting as a kid. The foliage behind the figures was unfamiliar, and I thought Matisse had made it up. On a visit to the Chapelle du Rosaire in Vence, I noticed the cacti growing outdoors and realized where Matisse had found the shape. Six, King's College Chapel, Cambridge, England. Our tour group was herded into Christopher Wren's masterpiece. At that very moment, the choir began to rehearse, and I quietly burst into tears. <laughs> the guide not noticed. Her look was kind, but I think she was a little embarrassed for me. The Museo Nacional Romano Massimo in Rome. Decades ago, I clipped a tiny picture from a magazine and put it into my scrapbook. I adored looking at this painted image of a garden, but I had no idea where it was. As we waited for our tour to begin, I glanced into the gallery across the hall and saw the fresco of the garden room from Livia's villa, 30, 20 to 20 BC. It was the very section I had pasted into my scrapbook. I leaped up and I started toward it, but was told firmly, wait, senora. <laughs> the Pantheon, Rome. This was not a place I was burning with desire to visit, but it was on every guidebook's list of must-sees. I walked into the vast hemispherical dome looked up 140 feet at the blue sky showing through the oculus and was spellbound. Sitting in the 2,000-year-old building left me entirely at peace. On sleepless nights, I returned to the Pantheon. 9. San Marco, Florence. Fra Angelico's Annunciation at the top of the stairs rooted me to one spot. The colors in Gabriel's wings were mesmerizing and begged for close scrutiny. Later, we roamed through the former Dominican monastery. I guessed that Fra Angelico's frescoes painted in the, on the dormitory walls probably inspired the 20th century surrealist art movement. movement. Montaigne saint, saint Victoire, Aix-en-Provence, France. Paul Cezanne was obsessed by the mountain and painted it repeatedly. When we rounded the curve on the superhighway, there was no mistaking it. To give you some idea of the mountain's size, 200,000 troops were pinned against its base by Romans in 100 BC. What lies ahead, Cole Porter's Purple Knight I'm sorry, purple light on a summer's night in Spain. Not during high season when it's hot, expensive, and crowded with tourists, but off season when I can slip on my museum shoes and walk to the Prado in Madrid or line up to see Gaudi's buildings in Barcelona. And my last poem uh, is going to take us to Manhattan. Manhattan icon. She sat in a doorway, legs jutting out, her arms in an El Greco Madonna position, not the one with arms and palms outstretched, hard to do while sitting on the ground, but the one with crossed wrists, hand held to harbor her heart or protect her breasts, her eyes, white saucers, cups thick with black coffee. Did I tell you it was raining? When her face took shape on my canvas, I thought about miracles and wondered if she was still holding out on 48th near 6th. So that's a taste of my book. A little o the earth. And so now I'll talk about how a book becomes a reality. And 
that's going to be perfect. Then we might have a few minutes for maybe a question and answer after that. My web manager, Patsy McGowan, uh, at one point, because I've been doing a blog since 2004, said, you know, someday, Judy, you should put your blogs in a uh, book. So I thought, you know, all right, someday. But I know when you write a book, you have to settle on a theme. So in 2012, I decided it was time to look at 10 years worth of Judy's journals, gather those which dealt with travel, and see where it led me. I had a vision, really a dream, my hands holding a square book about travel. Inside would be pages filled with journals, some artwork, and poems. The image was intentionally fuzzy because I knew challenges and surprises were waiting to happen. Experience being the best teacher, I also knew that a project like this would take years. The journals, and you've heard two. You heard the buffalo, and you heard um, the, um, just a kind of an overview uh, of many places with Cole, Cole Porter as our guide. The journals. I made hard copies of 21 travel-themed journals, which were written between November 2004 and May 2012. The good part happened quickly. Reading each one triggered vivid memories and returned me to places such as Barcelona, Reykjavik, Palermo. The challenge dawned gradually as I realized that heavy doses of revisions would be required Revision should be done in phases, and a writer's best friend is time. I worked on the journals, let months go by, and then did it again and again. The serious no-holds-bar revision would come after the first year. Good decision. Worcester ended up being the snowiest city in the United States at 120 inches. I kept to a schedule, taking breaks to help John move snow, eat, and sleep. If you ever see the Romanian film, The Turin Horse, you will understand our emotional landscape. The artwork. Because long-term travel, I was looking for it here and it's here, because of the long-term uh, journal revision process, my brain was immersed in travel. I would need to create artwork that offered readers a visual journal that to, to complement the written. My materials would be image transfers, archival ink, and pencil on a one inch, I'm mean, excuse me, an eight inch square clayboard. And here's a sample here, and you've been seeing them on uh, the screen. So um, this is, in this particular one, this is a transfer. Into the, onto the surface, and then inking, and sometimes pencil, archival pencil. Uh, are, I created things around it. Next, I listed places. This is very organized, and some people say, how can ours be so type A? Well, I am. So I listed every, <laughs> all the places John and I had ever visited, and researched 21 indigenous artists' black and white works. After choosing one from each artist, I transferred them onto clay boards. So Chagall, um, uh, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, Matisse. These were artists uh, whose uh, work came up in my list. I surrounded each image with ink and pencil designs that grew from memories. Amsterdam had canals. Lisbon, stone walls, Germany, architectural designs. Uh, Paul, I use Paul Clay's uh, painting uh, in that one. I worked from February 2012 through April 2013. And as the book took shape, I realized that I'd have to develop a brief written text around each work. So I added that to my list of things to do. So the book is now being built up. It's the journals and then alternating with working on the artwork, one inspiring the other. The poems. One day I took a break from revision and art making to gather my travel theme poems. And some were written dec decades ago and some more recently, so I, they needed a lot of revision. Writers revise. I think you, all of us who are writers in here know that's the name of the game. 
The striking thing was that the number of travel poems that, emer poems that emerged was 21. Sometimes there are coincidences, and other times it seems as if there's something else at work. The title. The book was taking shape, but without a title. Titles are telegrams of meaning, and creating them might seem easy. Here's the story behind the little O, the Earth, travel journals, arts, and poems. John and I were planning a long car ride together, and he suggested listening to CDs to pass the time. He had just purchased a set that analyzed Shakespeare's plays. Antony and Cleopatra came up around Syracuse, and we were held in the thrall of their passion and politics. I heard this passage from a Act 5 and was overcome not only by her love for Antony, but her description of the earth. His face was as the heavens, and therein stuck a sun and moon which kept their course and lighted the little O, the earth. There was a title for my travel book. I asked John to write it down for me. What a gift. The cover, and I'll show you this. The first artwork in the travel series integrated an image of the church in the center of Vallalunga Pratamano, Sicily, the town where my maternal grandparents were born. It was an early decision to have it on the cover. What would the background cover be, color be? I, would, I could continue the black and white scheme of the book's contents in, in the artwork. Gray, black with white borders. So I asked my sister Jenny, and she said, why not have it be the color of the special glaze that Sicilian potters use? Vermilion. Perfect. What a gift. Thank you. Peach and pear.